entrepreneurship was because these people didn't have experience in entrepreneurship. So anyone deciding to create an industry was an entrepreneur because they didn't know how to do it. It was really risky. And it was made by a, by a small elite not very well connected with the rest of Colombia and the world. And that makes it feasible the task of reconstructing, uh, reconstructing a social network, which is a fairly difficult kind of task if everyone is connected with the rest of the world, right? So what I tried to do is I tried to, uh, I basically collected manually and transcribed information about something like 2,000 individuals that live in this period, and I collected all the relational information that was available in, in different, in all the sources that I, that I checked. With that, I got <coughs> something like um, 100,000 uh, ties, and I also recorded all the uh, information available about industrial firms in this region before the Great Depression, so I ended up with something like 300 firms. What I tried to do in uh, practical terms, I tried to test a sort of well-defined discussion in sociology of why the social, why the social structure uh, affects the uh, individual performance, and that discussion has converged into two sort of fronts. On the one hand, there's people that emphasize the importance of local density, what they call closure, and just imagine these two different graphs in this and think about this guy who we will call ego. In this case, in both cases, he's connected with the same people and the same number of people, but in this case, all uh, her connections are connected uh, among them, right? This is a, uh, a network with more closure and uh, than this one. So there's a lot of people that argue that this is the right network where you should be, right? Because everyone is aware of what everyone is doing then. There's the emergence of trust and pro-social behavior and it's, there's also a better flow of, of information. On the other hand, there are some people that argue that the important thing is to be bridging different parts of the network, so to be central at uh, a sort of long distance kind of approach. And the basic idea here is that societies are composed by these sort of tribes, again, groups of people that have different kind of knowledge and interests and resources, and they are fairly disconnected among them. Once you connect these people, you can have access to all those resources in a sort of differential way. And in this case, you can tell that this guy is more important, even though he's connected with the same people. Here is more he's more important as a, as a bridge in the network. The usual way of measuring this is through between to, through the between the centrality. And the usual way of measuring this closure is through the something called the ego density or the possible coefficient, and there are several ways, but it's basically, uh, I'm going to call it big events. So let me go super fast through the, um, the evidence and the results of it, and I'll be done. So it's going to take two minutes. So as I told you, I have a data set of firms in which, for which, for each of them, I have information about the identity of the uh, partners, the people that created and, and founded the, the firm. And then I have a relational data set in which I have information about all the connections of uh, these people. And what I have uh, is uh, I constructed using two different methods. One is looking to particular social spheres where they were supposed to be located at. So think about guys that people that uh, were part of the same school, the same cohort. Basically, they were classmates, and I'm going to assume they were connected. The other method is, is, is a noble sample uh, approach in which I look for people particularly well connected in the network and uh, I basically look for the connections they had and then I went to those individuals and looked for the connections they had and that's how I drew the, the sample. So just to show you how I did that, I looked for genealogies, this is how they look, this is the, uh, the page where you have the information about the first Mejia, you have biographical information of him, information about uh, his offsprings, you can trace them in the same source. I look at churches and I look at records of baptism. You have the information about the individuals and their parents and grandparents. This is the information of firms. They have information about the shareholders and the date where the firm was created. I coded um, narratives of the period where they describe interactions between different kind of people. And I even went to the cemetery to 
solve the problems matching individual solver different sources and what's the deal with the symmetry because the deal is that you have a lot of information with very uh, uh, with large amounts of details about these individuals that helps you to disentangle which one was this guy and not this guy in different kinds of sources. And reconstruct the different dimensions of interaction, a family network, a political network, a different particular uh, criteria for defining what those interactions were. And this is how that those networks look like. Once you uh, agglomerate them, you have something called the complete network. And this is once again full of tiles. You cannot see them, but it looks great when you see it in a laptop. And I have a dynamic component of it. So this is how the network evolves in time. And you can see how the networks becomes more, how the network becomes more dense, uh, becomes denser. Uh, once I start to include people in the in the sample, and eventually it fades away uh, as soon as I stop recording people. So I basically take away the tails of the temporal tails of it, and I focus on the period where uh, the industrialization happened. And I get these results, and this is the last slide. <coughs> So what I find basically is that once under increasing the between the centrality, so the importance of individuals as bridges in the network was associated with a 60% increase in industrial involvement. That means the number of firms the individuals created, the industrial firms they created. However, variations in the density didn't have any significant effect. And I run a bunch of tests to show you that, that this correlation is not the result of observable, so it's not about the wealth, the gender, the age of these individuals. It's not either about constant and observable because I explore the temporal variation that I have and I basically use, uh, a, I run a panel with fixed effects in which I can compare the same individual in time. So they're not about things that don't change in time like the personality, the communicative skills, uh, or the cognitive abilities of these individuals. This is an either <coughs> Uh, driven by other metrics of the network, and it is also not an issue of uh, first these guys became entrepreneurs and then they had certain position in the network because once again I explore the um, the temporal variation to take lags and avoid this reverse causality kind of issue. And well, I run a bunch of tests to show that there's not a measurement error or sample sort of bias driving these results, and then I try to say, okay, I'm not having a causal claim here, but uh, there's a sort of story behind it, which is once again, markets didn't work properly and networks supplemented them as a mechanism for collecting different kind of resources. And I run some, some tests to show that. I offer first consistent narratives uh, that describe that that was the case. I show that the effects are larger in locations because I have also spatial variation. So I show that the effects are larger in less developed markets. And I also show that the effects only appear when I see the aggregate network, not when I see the same, when I see a single network, let's think about the miners network. To be a bridge in the miners network was not important because you were connecting similar people. And what you needed to do was to connect different kind of people. And that's pretty much it, that's pretty much it. So just in three bullets, why this um, dissertation is uh, interesting. Well, for hundreds of years, hundreds of years, we've noticed that interactions in world functioning markets have been rather the, the, have been the exception rather than than the rule uh, in human history. However, this is probably the first effort to address directly and explicitly that question, and that's why I think it is awesome. <laughs> and that's it. And I have some. Acknowledgements to give. I don't know if this is the time. Uh, maybe at the end. Sure. Yeah, sure. sure. Uh, I just hope. I, I just need that everyone stays here in order to not miss that. So, but yeah, it's, as you prefer. Thank you very much for your presentation. So now you will receive some questions and comments from the, your committee. Uh, first, we are going to start with uh, Professor Jackson. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Great. So, congratulations. This is a really an impressive and exciting piece of work. Uh, it's great to see networks in history. Um, what I'm going to do is ask a question on each of the three papers, and I'll, I'll start in the reverse order from the one you just talked about. And 
the, the main question I have about the third piece is what the actual mechanism is that helps somebody who's central in, in the, between the sense or, or related senses, what makes them special? And I think as you sort of, you know, they're, they're, you can think of various possibilities. One is that they're in a position to bring together different resources and they have knowledge that, that nobody else has in terms of bringing things together. There's also a, a separate issue which has to do with the enforcement of contracts, which obviously in a, in a situation without a, you know, a strong police and court system that, that you can trust, it means that these people have, had to be involved in many contracts. The complexity of the contracting would be essential in terms of making things work. And I wonder if you've thought a little bit about how could you disentangle sort of the knowledge and opportunity part from it, from the enforcement part of it. And, and was, it, was their position special because they, you know, they were strong because they had lots of contacts and were able to, to thus, you know, have a, a force in terms of enforcing things or was it because of the opportunities that they had and the knowledge that they had to bring things together? Thank you. Should I answer? As you prefer, you can uh, answer now or at the end. I would prefer to <laughs> get them together, so oh. probably just for communication, like twice or something. So if it, it's okay for you, Matt, keep going and I'll answer once you finish. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, and then on the, the second paper, um, one thing that I think is interesting, is, so it, you know, the, the basic forces that you're identifying make a lot of sense in terms of the increasing communications and changing the, the structure of knowledge. One puzzle that comes up is that if you look in the last few decades, you've seen a time period where this communication has increased at probably one of the fastest rates ever. And at the same time, you're actually seeing inequality increasing in a lot of places. So, it, you know, you're seeing some countries catch up that, that were behind in terms of development, but you're also seeing a lot of countries experiencing more fractured in the society than ever before. And I wonder, you know, how you reconcile this kind of, of change with what you, you see in your, uh, your paper. Um, with respect to the first paper, um, I think that the tribal aspect is fascinating. Uh, one thing that has always puzzled me, and I think is actually one of the issues that uh, anthropologists who study this question have struggled with quite a bit, is transitions. So uh, it's quite complicated for a, a tribal society to move to one with the agriculture, and from one with a little bit of agriculture to transition to one with in industrialization. And I wondered if you thought a bit about how you could take your model to begin to answer questions about these transitions and not just explain particular patterns, but actually explain the dynamics of how it is that, you know, uh, which societies can make it and, and how, can, how does the clan structure, the tribal structure within a society change during these transitions? And do you need the social structure to change first? In response to technology or availability, or does does it is it the other side uh, able to be around? Um, so those are the main questions I have. Uh, but very very yeah exciting work, uh, very stimulating. Thank you uh, very much. So I mean, yeah, I mean if I should answer, so let me start with with the first question. Um, I think that it's uh, probably the most interesting part of. Uh, the phenomenon, which is exactly yeah, what was the, the, the mechanism? I think that so far I'm not able to disentangle that mechanism to distinguish between this sort of complementarity issue and and the uh, enforcement of contracts. But when I thought about it, I'm not even sure if uh, there's a clear distinction of that in in reality. So. I've been thinking about the role, for instance, of a weak state, uh, which 
okay, we can agree that it is basically to provide uh, public goods, and you can tell that those sort of things are, for instance, uh, enforcing contracts, but it is also to provide other kind of goods like good highways, for instance, right? And what I see in the sort of complementarity, uh, the collection of, com of complementarity resources deal partly with, with that, right? It is to argue that being in touch with some people uh, allows you to overcome these constraints in, in the, the supply of public goods. For instance, get in touch with merchants that know how to transfer things through the river, right? So I'm not even sure, I'm not sure if you can even in theory distinguish between those uh, those two elements. What I can try to do, and I've, I have some preliminary exercise uh, in uh, that direction, is to uh, push a bit harder the, the sort of trust cohesion argument that usually seems to be described as the um, as the aspect that supports the enforcement of contracts without this with a superior kind of institution, and um, and that's probably as far as I can go for the moment. I feel. But if you have any idea on that regard, or anyone in the audience, I'll be happy to hear it and, and to explore more, more, more on that. With regard to the second, um, the second uh, point, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm also puzzled by, by this. Basically, my model predicts this sort of monotonic trend in until the end of, uh, of times, until the end of times, and and we can clearly see a throwback uh, in the social interaction patterns, the connectivity of the world, and even in economic growth uh, trends in general. And I think that part of that, at least this super like linear persistence in, persistence in my model is the result of the fact that I never introduced the markets that were, were substituted by social interaction, basically people keep interacting with different people because that's useful for the industrial sector. But once you have the emergence of educational markets, for instance, that's no longer the case, right? Because you can now go to the markets to get that sort of knowledge. So I feel that I can at least replicate at the aggregate level that uh, that trend once I introduce uh, this, the emergence of these new markets and I think that's kind of sensible. Uh, and finally, about transition, that's a great point. I haven't thought much about it. It, it is, in fact, the model, the sort of static model, and the technology that societies have are, are exogenous. Uh, I can try to, to, to think on these sort of technological transitions. And it's hard to think about it because what comes to to my mind, at least at the top of my head now, is that in growth, when we think about uh, technological transitions, we always think about markets doing that job, right? So I'm not really sure indeed how uh, and what thing would push this um, this technological transition. But in, yeah, indeed, it's uh, probably the most interesting direction in which to to, to move forward. Thank you, thanks a lot. Perfect, and so now, um, turn up. <coughs> Great job, it's very, very nice pieces. I, I enjoyed them much, both the papers. And let me ask you two questions. One is about the last paper that you presented to and the second one is about the second paper. So the one uh, regarding the second paper first, um, so, um, I very much uh, empathize and, and, and like uh, this idea of which societies which originally had global barriers for interaction among diverse people uh, and they uh, the world has today. But it seems to me that, I mean, the, the, the span of time that, that, that we look at is, is huge. Um, and it, it, it would seem to me that, that interaction among diverse people uh, might be very different things at different stages. Well, if we think about societies with low barriers to interaction, 
now at uh, in between drugs, the super cosmopolitan societies with huge cities and people bumping into each other and creating things. Where say for instance a thousand five hundred years ago and I might think about say for instance European capitals with a very active, very large and, and rich Jewish community, extremely active in uh, early scientific research, uh, commerce, finance, but but actually very separate from the rest of the social group, and very separate by means of various social norms that existed, who knows for what reasons. Or for instance, you could think of European nobility as this also very separate social features, right? Which and, I mean, in, in, and groups of people with, which in fact interact very little with the rest of society. So, so those in my mind come across as actually societies where, where you had some diversity, but where, 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 where in fact you had pretty high barriers for interaction among these different groups. So, so my, my question to some extent is, <coughs> and how, and how, how, how you thought about it, or how could you think about kind of these different forms of interaction among diverse people in, in such a long span uh, of history, and whether one can really process them and, and, and think about their consequences in a similar fashion, in a similar fashion as you in your model, whether one should I mean, think in more detail about these different views. Would you mind to keep going with the next question while yeah. I think about it, because it's sure. a super tough question? I, I'm sure I'm going to come up with something. So. <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the question about the third paper has to do with, I mean, I, I think it's it, uh, the contribution is very nice because uh, both in the sociology and economic history there has been this sort of tournament between uh, cohesion, ego density on the one hand, and, and bridging structural holes on the other. So I think it's, it's a wonderful contribution actually having. Uh, however, when um, when when we, when we goes in, into the details of the mechanisms that you propose for why these are important, uh, it, it seems to me that that actually including both <coughs> measures of centrality in, in a single regression is quite tricky because they're they can be very mechanically, very strongly negatively correlated. So you have somebody that has like a, a very high degree of centrality, they will almost certainly have very very low uh, ego density. So my my question is, or rather than my question is more sort of what 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 I think could be a very very nice avenue for future research, research is okay, could, could could we think about um, a, a, a network statistic which is better suited uh, than ego density uh, for testing sort of the, the importance of having access to at least a part of your net network being cohesive and allowing you to reach there and because maybe I don't need my my whole network to be super. Uh, cohesive and I, I don't need very high clustering. I, I just need high clustering in a certain part of my, my network you know, to be able to access financing and, and access, yeah, leverage resources and then I can also be a bridge. But I think this, this it, it'll be very difficult to really tweak this, I mean, look at these two things simultaneously because of the negative further. So, yeah, so those are my yeah, I, I think they're, they're super interesting. I'm going to start with the last one because it, uh, I, I recall that discussion I had recently. So I presented this paper in a workshop we had in Abdari two weeks ago with like experts in, in networks, and this thing uh, came up. And they were indeed concerned about more than the ego density, about the between the centrality and the like uh, estimation problems that you would have to think about this aggregate. Uh, this aggregate met uh, metric in a sample network, right? Which, which basically implies that once you have a, a, a sample network, you're missing definitely certain ties, and that will definitely ha ha will have a dramatic impact in the distribution of the between the centrality. But I think so. What I want to say with that is that it is a big issue, and I feel that the literature is probably getting into this sort of discussion, like for a long period of time we were developing like cool new metrics, and now we're trying to deal with what's the sense of them, and under which circumstances they should be applied or not. Um, and, um, and what I tried to do in this paper was just trying to move with the most standard kind of approach, right? Like you're thinking about local connectivity and closure, 
you probably have in your uh, in the top of your head uh, the Eagle density and if you're thinking about bridging the network in between the centrality. Now I, I agree with you that probably a good uh, way of moving forward is to uh, to think about well what about if we how robust is this to other sort of metrics and which one should be the ideal metric to capture the intuition that you have in mind which uh, address by the way something structural about other discussions in economics as Matt pointed out about what kind of interactions uh, replace the, the, the functioning of an institution that uh, enforces contracts or not, right? So I, I agree that that should be the direction that this, where this work should move, but also the literature, right? To offer metrics better, like supported in particular research questions, as we did, for instance, in this paper with the development of a support uh, metric. And the first question is really a difficult question, and it's, I've been dealing with it for a long time because I have this sort of like historic historian background and I mean, historians are always thinking about particular cases and actually they don't like a lot of this sort of general kind of approaches about general trends in history um, and I would like to move in that direction to think about particular historical episodes in which I could address concrete experiences of, uh, of varying years to interaction and to Pin down exactly what I mean by by that. So the the, the, the main problem there is basically the lack the, that we don't have much data on aggregate social interactions, right? So eventually I tried to do that. So my first uh, idea to to test empirically the model or to do an empirical sense of it was to calibrate it uh, and, and simulate it and test it with a really concrete historical episode. But after like months of rain, I always thought like the growth of China and how it eventually stagnated instead uh, how the uh, Great Britain eventually industrialized and I read for months uh, Chinese history and it was uh, at the end I, I, mm -hmm. I knew that it was not a feasible uh, sort of strategy to proceed in that direction but I'm looking forward to meet like a Chinese co-author that would help me with that. <laughs> uh, yeah that's what I can tell you now about it. Thank you. between country galleries and, and a farmer's society 
according because of the, the population is group, group. So, so in the in in that country you have that there is a, a, a an, an exogenous sport that is changing the, the, the structure of the of the of the, of the social interaction because of the population growth that, that is also the result of the of the, of the, of the economic and, and, and the demographic and the demographic forces that occur in the hunter of, on the hunter gathering societies. That, that is that is, the, 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 is the more than a question a comment and I, and I think that you should work a little bit on that. Uh, the second question that I that I that I sent to you yesterday is about about the uh, second paper. Uh, the second paper, I mean, you, you your main result is that you are able to find a correlation between the linguistic distances and the time of the takeoff. Uh, so, uh, and and. And you have a, and, and you find a, a positive relationship at the top of the of the of the distribution of the of the country. But the most important take takeoff were the ones that occur in the late in my 18th, 18th century and and early 19th 